Well, thank you. Thank you. I hope I don't put you to sleep. I know uh, what they said, uh, one, one fellow went to sleep, and the preacher said, wake him up. He said, no, you just want to put him to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. So, I hope I don't put you to sleep tonight. I, I'm thankful, though, uh, that uh, I was on his mind, aren't you? Yes. I'm thankful that he was able to look ahead enough in time to see me. Needed a Savior. And he saved me. I'm glad for that. I, I'm happy for that. You know, we, we're coming up upon Easter, a time that we celebrate the resurrection. You know, without that resurrection, we'd be wasting our time. You know, I'm, I'm thankful that, that he rose again. He conquered that death, hell, and the grave. Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1. And as you're turning, I know uh, I, I'm bad to write the songs down that we sing to see how they relate to what the Lord has put on her, on her heart tonight. And uh, that, that song that Brother Wayne picked out about fellowship. You know, we have good fellowship down here, but when we get there, we're going to have great fellowship. Right. And again, I, I was thinking about Sammy as he was talking about those precious promises. You know, right now we have farewells. We say goodbye to those that we love. We, we have heartaches and trouble. But when we get there, There'll be no more farewells but just hellos. Yes. Well, I'm glad of that. I, again, I, I was thinking about his love. You know, it's an endless love. You know, and I know the Bible talks about faith, hope, and charity you know, that abides. It says the greatest of these are charity. It's charity or love. We know that when we get to heaven, when we see Jesus, we won't need faith. Because right now we walk by faith and not by sight. We'll see him. Our faith will be realized. Our hope will be realized. Well, we won't need to hope because we're there. But you know what? We'll always abide in his love. That's charity. Again, I'm glad he stayed on that cross. I'm glad he stayed there so that, that he could save us. He was that, you know, he could have come down. He could have called legions of angels. You know, I, I'm glad it wasn't nobody else but him. I, I'm glad I couldn't have done it because I'd have been up there, Lord, kill them all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you would have too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead and get rid of the whole bunch. But he stayed there because he loved us. And in the Revelation chapter number one, we're, we're looking at here, again, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ given to him by the Father, given to Christ, given to an angel, given to John. And John wrote the book of Revelation with the unction of, the, of, of, the, of, this, of Jesus to give us what he wanted us to know and give us encouragement and give us hope and give us peace in a time that's coming. You know, uh, today, it's really, I believe it's a really a, a relevant study today. Because of the time in which we live. I talked to several uh, preachers during the last week or so, and you'd be surprised how many are in the book of Revelation this week, in the last few weeks. And I believe it's, it's a time that God is uh, bringing together. I, I, I don't know, nobody knows what day or the hour this thing is going to wind up, but we know it's winding up. We know it's coming to end. In verse number 8, is where we've gotten to. And he says, I am. Now, we, we, if we could stop right there to say I am, remember what he said? I am. He is the great I am. Yeah. And we say, he said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come. He said, the Almighty. And now we see here, who is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He said he's Alpha and Omega. What is Alpha and Omega? Well, if we look at the Greek alphabet, it's, it's the A and the Z. It's the beginning and the end. And, and, but he's not, he just said, I'm not just A and I'm not just Z. He said, but I'm everything in between. He said, he said I, I encompass it, it all. I am everything. And again, when we think about our Bible, this precious 66 books, you know how many letters is it comprised of? 26 letters, just arranged in different ways. Every book, every song, every word that's ever been spoken is used those 26 letters. 
Just 26 letters. And he is everything. Matter of fact, not only is he said, he said, I am Alpha and Omega. That means not only is he the beginning and the ending, he is that period at the end of the sentence. The end of all. And he said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, and the saith the Lord, which is. He said, I am. He said, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Who is he saying? I'm El Shaddai. El Shaddai, God. He said, I'm almighty. You know, Psalms 135, 13 says, Thy name, O Lord, endureth forever. He says, forever. And thy memorial, O Lord, throughout all generations. In Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 8 says, Jesus Christ the same. What? Yesterday? Today? And forever. So what does that mean? If we say he's the same yesterday, yesterday, today, and forever, what does that mean? He doesn't change. Hey, I'm glad he's not like me. I'm, I'm glad he doesn't have mood swings, right? You know, sometimes you ever met, any, met anybody that you didn't know who you was going to meet? They're different every time you meet them. One time you might meet them, they'd be happy. The next time you meet him, they'll bite your head off. You don't know who you're going to meet. But he's not that way. He said he's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. He's unchangeable. He said he's the old almighty. Again, Hebrews chapter number 1, verses 1 through 3. He says, God, who at sundry times in divers manners spoke in time passion of the fathers by the prophets, has seen these last days unto us by a son whom he hath appointed, heir of all things, and by whom he made the worlds. So hey, who, who created the worlds? Jesus Christ. He said he is the creator. And he goes on to say, who being in the brightness of his glory and expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, and when he laid by himself, he said when he had by himself purged, our sins. He stayed on that cross. He went through. What a terrible thing. What, what a price he paid for me and you. And what little he asked us to do in return. He, he just paid. Hey folks, he only paid it all. I like that song. He, Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. Yes. I, owe I owe him everything. And he goes on to say here, he says, By whom he also made the worlds, whom being in the brightness of the glory and express the image of his person, and upholding all things, by the word of his power, and when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. What did he do? Well, he sat down. And what does it mean when he sat down? His work was finished. Yes. It's done. Remember when we were taught in the tabernacle? The priest never sat down. Their work was never finished. But Jesus completed his work. And here, he said, And I, John, verse 9, he said, And I, John, who also your brother and companion in tribulation unto the kingdom, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on, well, he said, was in the isle that is called Patmos. He said, For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here, again, we see the writer, John. He said, And I, who is he writing to? He said, I'm your brother. So we know he's writing here. Again, we'll see here in just a few minutes. He's writing to the seven churches. He's writing to fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. He's writing to those that believe and accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. Yes. And he said, I'm your brother. He said, in tribulation. Now what does that mean? He's not talking about the tribulation time that we're going to be studying about. But he, right now, God said, you and I in this life, we're going to have what? Tribulation. Now what does that mean? We're going to have troubles. We're going to have trials. We're going to have heartaches. We're going to have tears. We're going to suffer. Yes. Thank God we don't suffer like us. Hey, I thank God I live in America, don't you? Yeah. Hallelujah. I thank the Lord we're not in North Korea somewhere. That's right. If it was, we'd probably already be in heaven. Yeah. But yet he says, I'm your brother in tribulation. Now, he didn't say the great tribulation. But he said, you and I, and again, we know, why was John on the Isle of Patmos? He told us. 
He, he was put there because of the word of God. He told us there in that verse, he said, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Hey, he got put there because he was preaching Christ and him crucified, him risen again. That got him in trouble. And we're seeing the day that it's going to get preachers in trouble in America. Today, right now, hey, we can say Jesus all we want to in church. Right now, we're, we're safe and we're happy. But you say his name on the street and see what happens. It's a coming, there's coming a day. There's coming a day. But right now, John said, I was put on the Isle of Patmos. He was banished there, and he was put there, and he was placed there because of his preaching. Now, he said, I'm your brother in tribulation. What did they do to him before they put him there? Tradition says they boiled him in oil. Now, do you think John had any scars on his body for Christ? I know the ladies got taught a class about beautiful scars. And let me tell you, there's a song that talks about loving my Jesus and showing my scars. You know, sometimes we try to hide these things and sometimes we, we're ashamed of things, but if it's a scar that's brought you out, that Christ has brought you out from, it's a testimony that for the work that he has done. Yes. Paul had scars. Remember what Paul said there in the book of Galatians, I bear in, the bar, I bear in my bar, body the what? Marks for the Lord Jesus Christ. He had scars. And here, John, he was going through tribulation and he, he went through trouble. He said, hey, hey, I've suffered right along with you. I'm, I'm stuck. Matter of fact, I'm stuck on this island. But he said, I'm not by myself. He said, they might have put me here and they thought they was leaving me alone. He said, but I've got a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I've got a friend that never leaves me nor first. Now, it's a friend that won't leave you nor forsake you. I wish I could say I could be a friend like that. But he can. And he is. And he will always be. And here, he says, for I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And heard behind me, he said, a great voice as of a trumpet. John said, I was there on this aisle. And I was sitting there. He said, I was there on the Lord's day. What's the Lord's day? It's not the Sabbath. What's the Lord's day? It's the day he rose again. First day of the week. That's the Lord's day. And he said, I was there on the Lord's day. And he said, not only was I there on the Lord's day, but the Spirit was there on the Lord's day. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now that doesn't mean John was sitting there in some trance going on. He wasn't doing that. No, what was he doing? He was communing with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was in charge. You know, we'd be good if we could let him be in charge every now and then. We'd be doing good. And John said, I was in the Spirit. And it was the Lord's day. You know what John was doing? I believe he was having a worship service. Hey, he didn't have a crowd to preach to, but it didn't matter. He was worshiping on the Lord's day with the Spirit. And here we see John, again, the Holy Spirit. We see John is being controlled here by the Holy Spirit. Then he says, he heard a strong voice. Now, Every time you hear the voice of God, other than that still small voice, he's he described as what? A strong voice, a loud voice, a voice of many waters, a voice of thunder, a voice of trumpets. And he said, as a voice, as it were, a trumpet. Yeah. One of these days we're going to hear a trumpet. Yeah. One of these days, and I believe it's coming soon, we're going to hear, we're going to hear the voice of an archangel. And the trump of God shall sound. And I believe what we're going to hear, I don't know, I don't know what we're going to hear. But I know what, we're, what we will do, we will, we will respond to what we hear. Yeah. 
There'll be no doubt. There'll be no wait a minute. Just a minute. I gotta finish this. Let me do this. I've got a, I've got dishes to wash. I've got clothes to hang out. I, no, you're going that then. Let 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 the antichrist hang your clothes up. Okay. And don't worry about your money. He'll spend it too. All right, that was free. We're going right along. And he said that strong voice. He said, I heard a strong voice as, a, as, a, as of a trumpet say, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He says, and what thou seest, he said, John, what, what you see, he said, write in a book. Yeah. Now, did you notice what he said? Write in how many books? A book. Yeah. Now, again, A, I think, is singular. Write in a book. But who are you going to write to, John? And here we find out. He said write in a book or a letter. He said write in a book and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia. So you're going to write in a book, one book. You're going to write to seven different churches in a book in one letter, seven different churches in one letter. So you might have had a book with seven chapters. I don't know. But you have seven letters but it's written in one book. Each, each church received that letter. So when, when you say that, they got to read each other's mail. Okay? So, and we're not going to get, we're not going to get it. We're going to be, we're going to see the seven churches here in the next chapter, in, in chapter two and three. But he said, send into the seven churches which are in Asia. He said, unto Ephesus, Unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So we see here the seven churches here. He said, write what you want. Write what you see. He said, write her down, John. So it'll say it again. He said, write her down. Why does he need to write it down? So that they may know. And guess who else gets to read their mail? We do. So that we can see. And he goes on to say here, write what you see. Again, he, again, let me say, he's the Alpha and Omega. He's going to show John. He's, he's going to show him it all. He said, John, write her down and send it to who? He said to seven churches. Now, there were more than seven churches in Asia. And we're going to see that here in a little bit. Not tonight, but there was Tros, there was Hierapolis, and there, there was several other churches. But he said, just send it to these seven churches. So I'm going to give you a question that you can ponder until we get to the seven churches. Why just seven churches? We know that seven, and we're going to see seven quite a bit, but seven is that God's number. It's a perfect number. It's, it's a divine number. We've got seven churches. We're going to have seven seal judgments. We're going to have seven trumpet judgments. We've got seven bowl or vial judgments. We've got the seven spirits of God representing the Holy Spirit. So seven. But why just seven? So th think about that. All right, so here, we go on and see. He said, and I turned to see a voice. And John, John turned and, he, and he's looking at a voice. He's, seeing, he's looking at who, who's speaking to him. And I turned to see, he said, the voice that spake with me being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. So now John is using symbolic language. We're going to see what that is here in a little bit. So he says, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And he goes on to say, and in the midst of these seven golden candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed in a white garment down to the foot, and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass as they were burnt as they burned in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. Can you say he probably wasn't soft spoken? You ever try to speak with anybody who's soft spoken? I have, now I'll be honest. Now Lisa says I have uh, I have selective hearing, but I tell her I'm hard of hearing. I have to say, say that again, please. I have to ask somebody to repeat, especially if somebody's very soft-spoken. I have trouble hearing that. 
But here, he said, you'll not have trouble understanding when Jesus speaks. He said his voice is like the sound of many waters. You know, it's be clear and it'll be concise. Hey, he won't stutter. He won't mispronounce. You know, I have trouble with some of these names. I know y'all probably don't. I just call them the kings of the unpronounceables. They're hard. But he don't have any trouble with it. He don't have trouble with it. And he said, and he gets his feet, and he talks about his feet. And he said, and in his hand, in his right hand, had seven stars. He said, in his right hand, and he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Uh, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Again, symbolic language. But yet we see in between these two symbolic languages, we see John describing the Lord Jesus Christ in his glorified condition, in his glorified state. Remember, he saw him before this way. This wasn't new to John. When did he see him? On the Mount of Transfiguration. Him and Peter and James. Peter, James, and John, the three. The three amigos, right? They saw him transfigured before him. Who did he see him with, by the way? Moses and Elijah. What were they talking about? They were talking about something, by the way. They were having a conversation, by the way. What were they talking about? They were talking about the things which were Jesus, which he was about to suffer. So, he saw him before. And again, now this, this symbolic, now this is not symbolic language with Christ. He has seen him as he is. He says, I saw him. Again, we see Jesus here. Again, what is he talking about? He said, in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And we're going to see verse 20 is going to clear that up for us. We're going to see that's, that's the church. Yeah. That's the church. And he's walking in the midst of the churches. The seven golden candlesticks represented the seven churches and Jesus in the midst. He walks in the midst. What does that mean? He is walking among them, through them, by them, around them, yes. before them. That's where he's at. The same place he is here today. Amen. He walks in the midst of his church. And here, John begins to describe him. John begins to, he, he says here, he, he said he's like unto the Son of Man. Now you remember, if you go back to the book of Daniel, Daniel had given him this title here. Verse, chapter number 7, verse number 13, he said, I saw in the night vision, behold, one like the Son of Man came, he said, with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, that's the Father, and they brought him near before him. So what do they do? Well, that just speaks of his incarnation. You know, a king got to have a coronation. And he is the king, by the way. He is. Remember the three offices that he has? We, we spoke of it often. He is prophet, priest, and king. And the king has to have a coronation. Not only does a king have to have a coronation, what else does a king have to have? That's right. He has to have a kingdom. And that kingdom is coming. That kingdom is coming. He so, so he said he's like the son of man. Again, that speaks of, his, of his, those positions that, that Christ holds as prophet, priest, and king. Again, let, let's look at those three just for a second. As prophet, what does he do? As prophet, what is his position as a prophet? He's proclaiming to the world. He proclaims the word to us. That's what a prophet does. He's proclaiming the word. As priest... Was it? What did the priest do? As priest, he's given us access unto himself. As priest, he gives us access. Not only to himself, but access to the Father. Because we're never going to see the Father unless we go through the Son. You're not going to go around the Son to get to the Father. That's not going to happen. You have to go through the Son. You have to. There's no, there's no, there's no getting around it. There, hey, there's no shortcuts. Boy, that's awful narrow-minded of you, isn't it? You mean there's only one way to heaven? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, I, and that's not my way. It's His way. It's His way. And, and, and there's only one way, and that's through Christ. Through 
the blood and the sacrifice that Christ paid upon Calvary's cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, all, it has to be that way or it's no way. If there's any other way, he died in vain. And let me tell you, the father didn't give his son for nothing. So what does that tell you about you? What does that tell you about you? If, if the father gave his son for you, how much are you worth? I know sometimes we get down on ourselves. I know sometimes we feel like we're not worth a thing. We get all twisted up. But let me tell you, when we get in that frame of mind, remember what, the, what price Christ paid for you. You're worth everything. You're worth his life. You're worth the Son of God. And he says, he, then again, we're talking about his, the prophet proclaiming the word. As priest, he gives us access unto his presence. But as king, what's he going to do as king, by the way? What does the king do? Well, king rules and reigns, doesn't it? A king rules and a king will reign. And so what's he going to do? He's going to reign over the affairs of just this one little group of people. Oh, no. He's going to reign over the universe. Over the whole. It's not going to be one just little group. He's going to reign over the whole. He's going to control it all. For he's Alpha and Omega. He is king. And you see, this, this king, he's going to rule. And not only is he going to rule, what else does the king do? But our king judges. Oh, we don't like judgment. No. But let me tell you, that fear of judgment will keep you out of a lot of trouble. And he goes on to say, and we, and we look here at these garments that he has on. We, we see that. He says, and I turned and saw it. He's in those seven golden hills amongst the, the churches there. And he goes on to say, he was clothed with a garment down to his foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Yes. So what's he talking about? This garment is a garment of sovereignty that he has on. He's girded all the way down to his feet. He's all the way, he's, <laughs> he's covered, okay? All the way down to his feet. And what's that speaking about? What's that telling of you and I? Hey, what is, what is that? That's the robe or garments of a judge. He's coming the first time he come as a lamb, yes. as a savior. This next time he's coming, when he steps out upon the Mount of Olives, he's coming as a judge. Yes. That first time he was smitten, this next time he'll do the smiting. Yes. He'll not be smitten again. And you see, this garment, it's a garment of, of sovereignty, of kingship. It's a judge's robe. Again, what robe did he have on when, he, when they put that purple robe upon him? What robe was that? Well, that was mocking him as a king, but it was a robe of shame to them. He'll never have that robe of shame on again. He'll never touch him again. And again, we see here this robe. John 19 and 5 says, Then came then came Jesus forth wearing a crown of thorns. You know, he was crowned. You remember that? When, they was going to, when Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, they, and Isaac asked Abraham, Abraham? He said, Daddy, got the knife, got the wood. Where's the sacrifice? He said, where's the sacrifice, Dad? <laughs> hey, I, I'm carrying wood. I don't mind carrying wood, but what are we going to use when we get there? What, remember what Abraham said? He said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Yeah. And we know, we know if we, we go through the story there, Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac, Isaac being a type of the, Abraham being a type of the father, Isaac being a type of the son, son being obedient to the father. Wait a minute, there's a noise. Wait a minute, Abraham. Look over there in the briars and the thorns. What'd you have? In the thicket. What'd you have? He had a, there's a ram caught. God provided himself a sacrifice. But yet, it was a ram crowned with thorns. 
with thorns. He had those thorns. And he goes, and again, that, that was a rabbit. I'm sorry. We're going to move right along. And he says here, he, and he, he said he, his, 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 this garment, his paps are girt. And again, that's that royal, royal estate that he's in. He says that he's going to be exalted in heaven. That's that breastplate that covers the heart. You remember that it's likened unto what the, the high priest wore, that he had all the tribes of Israel on those precious stones. He had, remember, you remember the breastplate that he wore? Remember the shoulders? The ephod that he wore, where he carried the burdens of Israel, then he's carrying Israel upon his heart. But let me tell you, Isaiah 49, 16 says this. Behold, behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. You're not. You're not only upon his heart, you're upon his hand. You're on his hands. He said, I have engraved you upon the palms of my hand. Thy walls are continually before me. And we go on and we see his hair. His hair, he talks about it being white. And that's not talking about him being old, by the way. We know he's always ever been. There's no time in God's timetable. I don't think he has a time X, by the way. He is time. He controls time. Thank God there won't be no watches in heaven. I've got a habit. I look at my watch. You ever been in the military, you'll look at your watch all the time. You, you, you just, it, they just ingrain that into you. But yet, there'll be no watches in heaven. And he's talking about his white hair. What is that? What does that talk about? It talks about him being sinless, his purity, his deity. You can go in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, compares that. We won't take time to go read that tonight. He said, but the eyes... He talked about his eyes here. He says, his head, was, his head and hairs were white like wool and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Oh, those eyes are ever looking. Those eyes are ever seeing. What are those eyes? He's omniscient. He sees all. You know, and as judge... He'll, have, he'll not have to call a witness, for he is the witness. He sees it all. And he gives his eyes where he's omniscient. In Hebrews chapter number 4, verse number 12, he said, For the word of God is quick. He says, And powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, even dividing asunder the soul and spirit. Now, that's getting right down to the nitty-gritty, isn't it? If you can divide the soul and spirit. Hey, that's really getting into it, isn't it? You ever had a problem dividing the soul and spirit? That's tough. I'll be honest, it's tough. But let me tell you, he can, he can take that, that word of God and it cuts it right in half. He says, even dividing... He said, the, the soul and spirit, and the joints and the marrow, and is even a discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. He knows our heart. I'll be honest, that scares me to death. That's why we need to repent quite often, I believe. But let me rephrase that. That's why Tim needs to repent quite often. Because he knows our hearts. We think we can hide, we, know, we can hide things from each other. And that's no problem fooling each other. It's really not. But yet, you can't fool him. Because he knows. He knows our heart. He knows what we think. And again, he goes on and he's describing here, not only he's omniscient, but he's talking about here his feet. His feet is like fine brass. And what is brass? When you look at brass and you think about what does brass mean in the Bible, brass is talking about judgment. It's judgment. Boy, you know... Thank God it's not all honey. But I do like the honey, don't you? But I, I, like, I like the bee, too. Because it takes the bee to make the honey. And again, that sting. I, I don't much like the sting of the bee, but I do like the honey, don't you? And he says here, that feet of brass, again, that, talk, that talks about his authority. It talks about his... Uh, and again, that, that fire talks about his judgment. It symbolizes his, his judgment, his strength, his... Perseverance. I like what he says here. That perseverance that brought the gospel. Isaiah 
52 and 7. It says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Yes. How beautiful. <laughs> ah, you know, Brother Tommy's got beautiful feet. Trust me. I ain't ever saw him, but the Bible says he does, so that's good enough for me. Amen. How about you? I'll, tell you? I'll take it for his word, won't you? He said, How beautiful. Hey, how beautiful are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings and publish peace. He said, and bringeth good tidings of good that publish salvation, that saith and design, thy God reigneth. Hallelujah. And that's what he's doing today. He's reigning. One day, that king is going to come, that king is going to have a kingdom, and he's going to rule and reign. Hallelujah. And he goes on, and again, he's describing here. He's describing the Son of Man. He's describing Jesus in his glorified state. And he says, and his voice, his voice as the sound of many waters. Now, what does his voice represent? Well, that's just power and authority. He's, he's describing. when. Now, let me say that when he speaks, you're going to listen. Yeah. I'm going to listen. When he speaks, we're going to obey Hey, it's no second thoughts about it. You won't have to say, I, let me think about it. No, when he says, we're going to go. He has a voice of authority. Yes. You know, you remember all the demons he cast out? You remember legions? Remember what they said to him? I know who you are. I know, we know who you are. You're the son of God. You're the, you're, 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 the, you're, the, you're the son of God. He said, he told him to be quiet. In other words, he said, hush up. Hush up. What did he do? He said, don't, don't, don't throw. He said, don't put us in the abyss. What is that? Well, these demons know about this bottomless pit that their leader is going to be put in one day. That he's going to be cast in. He said, don't, we don't want to go there. We don't want to go there. Let us go to these swine. You know, they're bargaining with him, wouldn't they? They're bargaining. Hey, and let me say, you can't bargain with God, but God let them go into the swine. What did they do? So they run down the hill, drown themselves. And again, we see here, his voice. That's power and authority. John 10, 3 and 4 says, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep. Now I like, who's the sheep, by the way? Right now, where are the sheep? The church is the sheep. We are the sheep. He said, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name. Amen. Where's your name? It's on his hands. Let me say, if you have somebody's name engraved in your hand, you better love them, right? Because they're going to be there. And he loves you. Yes. And let me say, what about all the people that's ever been, saved, ever been saved? He's got them all. He's got them all. He's got big hands. He's a big God. And he says, this voice, he said, to him the porter hath open, the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth the sheep by name, and leadeth them out, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth, he goeth before them, he doesn't get behind them, he doesn't go to the side, but he walks before them, and the sheep follow him. Yes. Hallelujah. And they follow him. He said, for they know his voice and his voice. He says, his voice. Now what does his voice do? His voice brings majesty. His voice brings peace to those sheep. His voice brings comfort to those sheep. His voice brings rebuke to those sheep. Yes. Those sheep love him. That's his voice. That's what his voice does. And his voice is, his voice, his voice brings conviction to you and I. And that same voice that brings conviction and brings salvation will bring judgment and damnation. That same voice. Over here in Psalms chapter 29, he says in verses 3 and 4, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. And the, and the God of glory thundereth. He said, the Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. So when he speaks, there'll be no wondering who is doing the talking, by the way. We won't have to say, who was that? You remember when Paul, 
Saul was on the road to Damascus. And he heard that voice, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? <laughs> Saul looked up and said, who is it, Lord? <laughs> Paul never, Saul never saw it. Well, I'll take that back, he did see. He did see. But yet, he recognized his voice. Because Paul was an apostle. And to be an apostle, you had to see the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul, Saul, recognized him for who he was. He said, Lord. And he goes on to say here, in verse number 17 here. Well, and he says his countenance. Let, let, me, let me get into that. He said his voice. He said they're powerful. Then he talks about his countenance. He said, was as the sun shineth in strength. Hey, he was glowing. You remember when on, again on that Mount of Transfiguration, how did he look? He was glowing. He was shining. Remember when Moses spent a little time up there on the mount getting the Ten Commandments? When Moses come up, Moses, Moses got to spend some time with God. God had wrote on the tablets those Ten Commandments. Yes. The law. Moses come down, he had to wear a veil. Why? Because he was shining. Why was he shining? Not because he washed his face, but because he was in the presence of God. Yes. He was in the presence of God. Hey, I don't know, but the Bible says we will be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Because we're going to be like him. We're not, hallelujah. Again, I, I thank God we're going to have glorified bodies. Amen. I'm glad that I, I know that I won't have to be walking around in heaven with this body. I was watching, and I'm not picking on Paul. But I was watching Paul get up from the altar. And I know his knees is hurt. And I know, hey, but he, he's having a hard time getting up. But Paul, there'll be no bad knees in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. There'll be, no, there'll be no walkers, no none of that mess in heaven. Hey, we'll have perfect bodies. We'll have a perfect mind. We'll have a perfect body. Hey, we won't have the same old thought pattern we have today. And he goes on to say here, he said, and then when I saw him, what did John do when he saw him? He said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. He said, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. So John here, what did John do when he saw him? Now John had been with him. John had, saw, John had, had already saw him in his... In his glorified state, John had been with him in his earthly ministry. John, hey, John was the one who laid his head upon his breast. John was the one whom Jesus loved. John, hey, John. Now I say John was pretty close to Jesus. Yet he, what did he do when he saw him? Fell on his face. We know what we're going to do. Same thing. We're going to fall on our face in a prostate position. Hey, because we're going to be before a holy God, a holy one who paid the price. And John, he said, he fell before him. And John, John was, well, John was uh, uh, familiar with, but notice here, in, in, in this time of fear, John fell down. And this time, what happened to him? He laid his right hand upon him. He said, fear not. You know, in the time of trouble, there's comfort. In a time of fear, there's comfort. And Jesus provides that for us. Yeah. He provides that for us. He said, he said, now, hey, fear not. Why? Because right now, he is appearing to John in love and not in judgment. Yeah. Hallelujah. And when we stand before him, it's going to be in love and not in judgment. Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank God. Hey, if you, don't, if you don't bow your knee on this side... You'll bow your knee on the other side. Yes. I much rather bow my knee now yes. in love than I had to bow my knee over here in judgment. Yes. And we find here, and he goes on to say, he said, I am a dead, I said, I am the one, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead. Oh, wow. Hey, but he said, I'm alive forevermore. What does that mean? He'll never die again. 
He, if you can lose your salvation, it means his, his death was not sufficient. But let me tell you, it's more than sufficient. It's for eternity. And we find here, he said, I am the one. He said, I live it now. I'm, I, I'm, I'm living and was dead. He said, I'm alive forevermore. And he said, I've got the keys to hell and death. When did he get them? Well, that's a good question. Some say he got them when he went to the heart of the earth. I, he probably did. I don't know. It doesn't really say. But let me say, he's got them. He has them. And that's all that really matters. When did he get them? Well, he may have went and snatched them from the devil then. I, I'm not, you don't really tell us. But he got them. Yeah. That does tell us that. He has the key. Hey, matter of fact, he has the keys. You know, that's like having the keys to the house. Who's going to get entry into your house? Only those who has the key. Right? Now, men, here's one for you. Are you ready? Who has the remote? That's the one who has control of the TV. Right? You'd be watching a channel and pretty soon then you're not watching something you don't want to watch. You're on the Hallmark channel or something like that. <laughs> Instead of Fox News, you're having to watch something else. And that's all I'm going to say about that. We're going to move right along. And he says here, he says, and he says, John, he said, I'm alive. I was dead. He said, I'm going to be alive forevermore. He said, and I've got the keys. In other words, I'm in control. I have it. He said, don't worry. You ever had to, we ever worried? Sure you have. We've all worried. But let me tell you, he is in control. He has never lost control. He's sovereign. And we're going to, we're going to finish the chapter tonight, by the way. And he said here, I'm going to take a page out of the book. Adrian Rogers said this very next verse is a key to understanding the book of Revelation. Adrian says this is the golden key that unlocks the book. And here's what he says in verse number 19. Write these things which thou hast seen. What is that? That's Christ. That's Jesus. Write about what you've seen. That's Jesus. That's chapter number one. And the things which are. That's the seven churches. Chapters two and three. And we're, we're going to see them next Wednesday. That's the seven churches. He said, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. That's just chapter 4 through 22. Yeah. That's the things that's going to be. He said, and that's the key. Hey, that, that's the outline broke down. Which was, which are, and shall be. Which was, chapter 1, which are, 2 and 3, which shall be, 4 through 22. Yeah. And then he goes on now here. He's going to reveal to us that seven, the seven golden candlesticks and the seven stars and the mystery of the seven stars which thou sowest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the seven angels are the, are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So he said the seven angels are the, are the, seven, the stars are the angels. What, are the, what is an angel? The angel is a messenger. Could be the pastor of the church. He's the messenger in the church. So these seven stars are the seven pastors or messengers of the church. And the seven candlesticks are what? The churches. What, is a, what does a candlestick do, by the way? Well, it's got it's to give off light, right? It's got to give off light. And if that candlestick don't give off light, what do you have? You've got a stick. So we've got to give light. What does the church do? We're here to give what? Light and salt. That's what we're to do. We're to be a light unto this world, aren't we? That's what we're to do. And to be a light, what do we have to have? We've got a messenger. We've got a pastor here that leads us in the way of the word, in the way of God. And he says, and again, again, when, when, he, when he gives a symbolic language, you just got to keep reading it. it. It will tell you what that meant. Again, the seven candlesticks, the seven stars, symbolic. When he talked about Jesus, that was literal. So what do you have? You've got symbolic language describing a real 
person or event. That's what we have. And here, and that's what he said. He said, write what you want, seen. He said, John, I want you to write her down. What's John saw up to this point right now? And we're getting ready to close. What's John saw? He saw Jesus. How's he saw him? How's he saw him? Uh, that's good English, isn't it? He said, there'll be no bad English in heaven. Hallelujah. We'll all speak perfect English. And it's not hillbilly, hillbilly Hebrew neither. <laughs> what is it? He said, who is it? It's Jesus. Well, he saw him in his person and he saw him in his power. Amen. And we're going to see him here later on. Chapter, starting in chapter number 6, we're going to see in his power, but his power in motion. So, but we'll stop. Pick up in chapter, we'll pick up in the churches next Wednesday. So we do thank you tonight for your, for your attention. We thank you for, your, for being here.